All right, but as for you all, you're here, so. We will get started. There we go. All right, so on Tuesday, we covered the beginning of the Baroque era and Baroque and vocal music. And so today, we're going on to Baroque instrumental music. All right, some basics about instrumental music in the Baroque era. So you start to see um, a change in focus, and the focus moves on to um, sort of what you could call abstract um, models or abstract genres. They go away from um, vocal, um, music, they de emphasize the models of vocal music. They start to borrow from um, borrow from that and expand upon vocal styles within the instrumental music. So uh, they do such things as moving the affections. We talked about the doctrine of affections the other day, um, focusing on the soloist and on the elements of being a virtuoso or somebody who's extremely gifted um, and competent performer. Um, the idea of idiomatic composition, so focusing on what is specific to a certain genre or um, type of piece and styles as well, uh, including recitative and aria, again, like what we saw in the last class period with vocal music. So all those things working together now um, doing the instrumental versions of them. The types of instrumental music, um, people like to categorize things. So um, this is kind of what you see in terms of the performing forces. So we're talking about the kinds of instruments. Um, for, in terms of solo works, uh, so for one musician, you might see for a keyboard or for a lute, um, something called a theorbo, which is like a, a large lute. Um, the guitar starts to become popular at this time as does the harp. So those things working, or uh, those are solo instruments that have been typical of the period. Um, you had chamber works, be another performing force. Um, so a soloist or a chamber group uh, with a continuous. So we're talking smaller ensembles, groups that uh, probably didn't number more than about 16 players, um, if that. String quartet would become pretty popular in your short order. Um, and then you have the larger ensemble works, which would include two or more players um, per part. In terms of the venues, um, the venues are pretty straightforward. It might be what you'd expect. Uh, number one, since we're talking about uh, chamber music, there's the chamber, which would be like the large front room of a house. Um, so think of it as, as kind of a large living room, if you will. Um, there's the church, which is always a, a good place for music at this time. I mean, the other thing that's developing at, at this time in terms of the venue is the theater. And you start to see people building theaters, particularly as opera becomes a thing. Um, they realize that operas, or these concert halls, aren't just good for opera, that you can find other types of music. Somewhere. Nationality, it'd be a lot of the players that you would, uh, that you would tend to think of. Um, Italy, France, Germany, England, Spain, and the elements of music um, as they're used in each um, each avenue or in each country, excuse me, um, has some pretty specific um, stylistic type things. Like um, Italian music usually is a little, a little more energetic. French music's a little fancier. Uh, uh, it's got a little more embellishment to it. German music is very forceful. English music is very stately. It's kind of what you would come to expect. I mean, if you just think stereotypically about the nationalities, it's kind of the the ideologies um, that work behind behind this. Um, now, as we move on, the second half of the century, um, the instrumentation gets a little more specific, um, and you start to see the stylistic elements uh, mixed together a little bit. 
So one of the major things that comes up at this time is a, is a uh, genre of music called Takata. And these Takatas are um, kind of these big uh, embellished pieces of music, um, usually for keyboards, you know, keyboard type instruments. So either the harpsichord or the organ, the pianoforte hasn't really come into, um, into its own. And you know, there's a particular composer by the name of Frescobaldi, um, who is really, really well known for his um, for his works on the keyboard. Let me grab, um, grab this piece here for you. For you, Frescobaldi. So here is the Rama Festival of these Takata number three. Post movement. So this is fairly typical for a Takata, that they would have that kind of movement throughout the piece. And a lot of times they would be, they'd be paired with another piece called a, a fugue. So uh, this is Frescobaldi himself. Um, and this, uh, he actually worked at uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome for quite a while. Um, this is what the date. Um, this is actually a chalk drawing. Um, that was done. So, 
so you can get a look at what the music was looking like this time. This is uh, one of his pieces uh, from 1635, and the music that um, this is from his uh, Toccata Before Mass for Sundays. Um, he published the work uh, in what's called an open score, um, so with the four parts like that, rather than in uh, two staffs like we would typically see a lot of uh, piano-based or keyboard-based music as was usual um, kind of at that time, um, because he thought that it was important for performers to be able to read across all four at once rather than combining each together and combining uh, those two together. Really trying to push the uh, the status of or the level of um, musicianship of the day. So, in addition to the Takata, um, two of the other big um, or the other, I guess, big type is what's called uh, Arisa Car. Um, something else, Arisa Car, something else, Riscare. Um, I heard I was taught Risa Car, so that's what I said. So, uh, the Risa Car, it's a more stately, serious composition it can be for organ, can be for uh, harpsichord. Usually, what happens is you have one subject, a theme, um, that gets developed like over and over and over again. So, um, such as uh, the piece that I just um, showed you on the, on the previous slide, um, Mass for the Madonna and uh, Fiori Musicali. Um, the fugue develops in Germany, early 17th century. And it's something that will get used um, over and over throughout throughout music history. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here, real quick. As soon as I can get YouTube to play ball with me. So here's an example of um, this is Frescobaldi's uh, Master of Madonna, the music are after the credo. Definitely in contrast to the Takata, this is much more stately. It's not as experimental or as uh, fanciful as the Takata. Probably the best example of a, of a Takata and its accompanying few. Is going to be uh, J.S. Bach. Um, he fits um, just kind of into our time period. I'm going to show you guys this version. I like the visual stories like this. I think it does a good job on this piece. My recommendation. 
Oh, this is one musician, I'm glad. Really great music, and it really shows off uh, the abilities of these individual composers. Um, and again, a lot of them were uh, were performers as well. So being able to get that um, aspect of it. So one of the other, uh, so again, this is largely keyboard music, and we'll listen to a couple other types of music or other instruments. Um, you have what's called the Fantasia, um, which is supposed to, as the as the name suggests. It's supposed to sound a little bit like a fantasy, um, like giving a, a sense of being in some place other or listening to music that's kind of takes one out of this space in a sense. So uh, usually a, a little bit larger piece um, than the Risa cars. The Risa cars you saw could be fairly short. Um, so two composers who are uh, pretty vital to this development um, Jan Peter Zun, uh, Sri Link, and then uh, Samuel Scheidt, who uh, Sri Link used, um, was important in development with, excuse me, fugues. Um, Scheidt was important with use of what's called tablature, um, which is uh, a different type of uh, way to learn um, kind of note reading, um, or at least development of uh, learning pieces of music. Let me bring a little bit of Here's a Sweet Link um, piece. This is something called hexachord fantasia. Uh, hexachord means that there's six. It's based on a kind of a chord of six notes or a chord progression six notes. Thank you. 
pretty straightforward. Nothing hugely out of the ordinary. I start to get into it. Nice simple piece. Okay, the Kinzona, so we've got Takata, Risakar, Fantasia, Kanzona. Um, the Kanzona uh, is a piece for keyboard or for an ensemble. Um, an ensemble Kanzona could be played with four or more um, parts. Um, and it could be played with or without what's called a continuo. Now, this continuo part was usually played by uh, harpsichord or cello um, or a piece like that, kind of keeping like the bass line, uh, if you will. These are very popular both in church as well as in chambers. Um, they usually have a lot of contrast between the different sections, the different movements. Um, there's usually more formal aspects of like Renaissance era music, particularly the use of multiple voices, what we call polyphony. Offline music. It's very rhythmic music, often lively character uh, that gets experienced throughout. So let me grab a uh, comes on. Um, let's see. So here is a comes uh, on by uh, JS Bach. Bowman in B mall, which is turned for B minor. So it says manual, so that's the keyboard. So if they have keyboards and then pedal, means that that's being played with B. being played by one person. It's both hands on two different keyboards plus the feet. So it's kind of like playing the drums. Requires a lot going on at one time. I've long said that if you can find a good organist, they are practically right there where they're going to It's not an easy instrument to play and to develop the skill on it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of years. So, um, that brings us to a sonata, 
Usually at this time, a sonata is written for one or two um, melody instruments, oftentimes violins, um, with a um, with the basso continuo again. And a lot of composers started um, using widely this uh, imitated modern uh, expressive vocal style um, in the writing of their sonatas. Now, one of the things that I think is really neat in their approach is that they're imitating uh, this vocal style and they're taking settings of existing melodies uh, or they're setting existing melodies, excuse me, as part of um, the development of, of the genre of a sonata. So I'll give you a, a little bit here of, uh, this is by a composer named uh, Biagio Marini. He was a violinist at uh, St. Mark's Church in Venice, which is like next to St. Peter's Basilica at this time. St. Mark's was like the best job you could get as a, as a musician. So I'll give you a little bit here of this while you take a copy. This is the sonata number four for violin. Violin and organ. So you can see right here, these are the two manuals. And then these are the stops right here, the various switches on either side. The letter of uh, the order must change the voice that's heard on the organ. Yeah, there you just put one of those stops. Totally changes the sound of the organ. Now with all this music that's being written right now during the Baroque era, there's actually a lot of publishing that was going on. So um, Marini, for example, um, he published 22 collections of vocal and instrumental music um, as he went back and forth between Italy and um, Germany. So one of the big um, developments, passions, perhaps, of composers during this time was the development of sets of variations. So a lot of times that you have this for keyboard uh, or for lute um, instruments. So um, they would either borrow these themes, which again seems to be um, a consistency, or they would just go ahead and compose new ones. It, it really kind of um, it depended on, on whatever struck their fancy. So they used a lot of common variation techniques from this time. So one of them would be what's called a cantus firmus variation, which would mean that they would take a snippet of a melody, a lot of times a uh, Gregorian chant was used for these, these cantus firmus um, variations. And they would take it and they would manipulate it over and over and again and embellish it. Um, the harmonies, um, the accompaniment would remain unchanged, unchanged, excuse me. Um, the bass part and that progression of chords 
usually held pretty consistent. The other thing that you had was the cone and the passacaglia. Um, these become fairly um, fairly distinct in terms of uh, their sound. I think it's probably going to be easier if I just play. Play some nice for you. So here's uh, this is a Prescobaldi piece again. Um, this is harp score. So this is. Um, This is from his uh, Partit uh, Sopra uh, Chikong. Okay, so I've heard a lot of harp support. I'm ready to hear some blues music. So this is from a, um, from a composer named Silvius Weiss. Um, this is a type of uh, piece called a Cerebon. It was more of a dancey, it would be a dance type piece. So this is from a Baroque piece. Couple more examples. So this was a lute. So this is a field ball, which is a larger lute. Not a long one, please. Nothing else would make a great conversation piece.
I'm not sure if you get a set in the car. I'm going to have to borrow a van. Well, and then, yeah, let's see. Here we go. This is a, um, this is a duo. So you've got a Yorgo and a Baroque uh, style guitar. Baroque guitar is a little closer in style to a like a Fiat Puebla or something like that. Um, some of the traditional um, Mexican folk guitars. So definitely some some really cool sounds, some really neat music that's being um, written at this time. So we can't leave out dancing music when we're talking about instrumental um, music. So a lot of the dance music that was done was definitely for social settings. So whether it was done in the home or whether it was for more of a a, a gathering, you know, somebody putting a, a party at their home, or specifically a ball or a dance, that would be one of the, one of the biggest aspects of it. Also could be used for theater. Um, a lot of times um, in the development of Baroque theater, they would have these opportunities for uh, dancing sections or dance style music within um, their larger works. So. Oftentimes, um, if there, the music wasn't necessarily designed for dancing itself, um, you would have what would be called stylized dance music. So stylized dance music you can think of as dance music that you don't dance to, which I know sounds a little bit strange or a little bit like an oxymoron, um, but this music was usually, the stylized stuff was usually music that was designed to be listened to. Um, so you would have music that was a little more complicated and maybe a little more interesting um, that the audience would want to actually um, stop their dancing and listen to. Um, we get that today. Um, matter of fact, there's a large portion of uh, electronic dance music um, of EDM that's not necessarily meant for dancing. It's meant more for listening. So a lot of times what you would have then with this is you'd have what we call uh, suite. So maybe you've heard before of like a uh, suite of furniture, like a bedroom um, suite or something like that. It's uh, things that are meant to go together or linked together as a group. And so in this case with the suites, you have several dances then um, that usually would go together. So you'd have um, things like uh, a courant, an alamon, a pavon, Galliard stuff coming out of the, the uh, Renaissance tradition. Um, a triple up. In terms of uh, 
what sets up um, the early 17th century. So again, in the Baroque era, we're talking 1600 to 1750. So the early 17th century drew um, very heavily on the 16th century tradition. So what they ended up doing, um, first and foremost, is they started to redefine some of the genres that are already out there. Um, you'll see this as you as we move into the classical era, um, whether next week or week after next, um, in terms of the genres themselves, definitions will get tweaked a little bit. So, for example, in my music history textbook that I use with uh, music history one two and three students, uh, they you know, have a def or have a term, and then it might have three definitions under this under an essay. In the Baroque era, it meant this. In the classical era, it meant this. Now it means this. So we can definitely start to see uh, changing or redefining uh, existing genres. Second thing is the genres and the techniques that get established during the Baroque era really begin to set the, the tone for really the next two or three centuries. Quite frankly, we're still still dealing with it here in the 21st century, some of the, the ways and means in which they did things in terms of the form of pieces of music, or even this idea of the, the suites, uh, the stylized dance music. We still do that. Um, but what the degree of, of uh, regularity in, in formal composed music and concert music today, uh, even the idea of having uh, like the suites, the, the group of pieces together, um, which is why Tchaikovsky's work, uh, the Nutcracker Suite. So you've got a series of pieces that seem to go together, and it's not all necessarily something we dance to, but certainly danceable, uh, danceable music. Um, and finally, this music was rediscovered at the end of the 19th century, and it was really celebrated throughout the 20th century. There were people like um, it was Felix Mendelssohn and um, Brahms, Hans Brahms, who began to bring some of this music out and perform it. And certainly as we got into the 20th century, this was very popular music. Um, a lot of the stuff that you're in, in the door of era. Maybe not necessarily the pieces that I played for you, but music like that began to be discovered and popularized throughout the 20th century. And uh, there's so much more that, that I could go into with this, particularly um, just having you listen to all different types of pieces. There's a reason why we do three music history classes in the music major. You guys get it all compressed into one 15 week class versus three 15 week classes. So it's what I consider to be really kind of the, the struggle with teaching a, a music appreciation versus have to compress all this down into, into one. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for your time. I'll let you out a couple minutes early. Have a good weekend.